Good evening and welcome to Spiritual Story Time. I'm Domo Geshe and we're here at Lotus Lake uh, Buddhist Monastery and Retreat Center. Uh, beautiful spring day we have. Hope your day was lovely. Uh, we're enjoying stories by God, stories of God. It'd be nice if they were by God. <laughs> stories of God uh, by Rainier uh, Rilke, who actually was quite a uh, esoteric writer and poet. And I definitely, although I have not read more of Rilke, uh, that I have uh, definitely see his uh, deeper meanings in his stories, which very often uh, seem like they're stories for children, but uh, they're not. Although I'm sure children can understand them quite well. So I'd like to begin tonight uh, with a story that is called How the Thimble Came to Be God. When I stepped away from the window, the evening clouds were still there. They seemed to be waiting. Should I tell them a story too? I proposed it, but they didn't even hear me. To make myself understood and to diminish the distance between us, I called out, I am an evening cloud too. They stopped still, evidently taking a good look at me. Then they stretched toward me their fine, transparent, rosy wings. That is how evening clouds greet each other. They had recognized me. We are lying over the earth, they explained, and more exactly over Europe. And you? I hesitated. There's a country here. What does it look like? They inquired. Well, I answered, a twilight with things. Uh, Europe's like that, too, laughed a young girl cloud. Possibly, I said, but I have always heard that the things in Europe are dead. Yes, of course, said another cloud scornfully. What nonsense that would be, living things. All the same, I insisted, mine are alive. So that's the, that's the difference. They can become various things, and one that comes into this world as a pencil or a stole need not yet despair on that account of advancing in life. A pencil may someday turn into a staff, or, if all goes well, into a mast, and a, a stove at least into a city gate. You seem to me to be a very simple-minded evening cloud, said the youngster who had already expressed herself with so little reserve. An old man cloud feared she might have offended me. There are all sorts of countries, he said kindly. I once chanced to come over a, a small German principality, and I've never to this day believed that that belonged to Europe. I thanked him and said, I see it will not be easy for us to come to an understanding. Allow me and I will simply tell you what I saw below me recently and that will probably be the best way. Please do, agreed the wise old man cloud in the name of all of the rest. I began. People are in a room. I am fairly high up, you must know. And so it is that, to me, they looked like children. Therefore, I shall simply say, children. So then, children are in a room. Two, five, six, seven children. It would take too long to ask them their names. Besides, they seem to be having an earnest discussion, so there's a good chance that a name or two will be given away in the course of it. They must have been at it for some time already, for the eldest, I observe they call him Hans, is saying in a tone of finality, No, it certainly cannot remain like this. I have heard that parents used to always tell their children stories in the evening, or, or at least on evenings when they had been good, uh, till they went to sleep. Does anything like that happen now? 
a short pause, then Hans answered himself, it doesn't happen anywhere. I, for my part, and also because I'm fairly grown up, would gladly let them off these few wretched dragons that would bother them so, uh, but still they should by rights tell us there are fairies, brownies, uh, princes, and monsters. I have an aunt, a little girl remarked, and she sometimes tells me, oh, go on, Hans cut her off, aunts don't count, they tell lies. The whole assembly was much taken aback by this bold but uncontradicted assertion. Hans went on. Besides, we are above all concerned with our parents, for it is their duty, in a way, to instruct us in these matters. Others do it more out of kindness. We can't expect it of them. But just listen now. What do our parents do? They go around with cross, annoyed faces. Nothing suits them. Uh, they shout and scold, and, and yet they are really so indifferent that if the world could, came to an end, they would hardly notice it. They have something which they call ideals. Perhaps those are some sort of small children that they may never be left alone, and that makes a lot of trouble, but then they shouldn't have had us. Well, I think it's like this, children, uh, that our parents neglect us is, is sad, uh, certainly. But we would put up with that if it were not a sign that grown-ups generally are growing stupider, deteriorating, if one may say so. We cannot hinder their decline, for all day long we cannot exert any influence on them, and when we come home late from school, Nobody will expect us to sit down and try to get them interested in something sensible. And it really does hurt when one has been sitting and sitting under the lamp and mother cannot even understand the Pythagor Pythagorean proposition. Well, that's how it is. So the grown-ups will be growing stupider and stupider. No matter. What can we lose by it? Culture? They take off their hats to each other, but if a bald spot comes to light, they laugh. Anyhow, they're always laughing. If we hadn't sense enough to cry now and then, even, even these matters would get entirely out of balance. And they're so arrogant. They even declare that the emperor is a grown-up. I've read in the newspapers that the king of Spain is a child. And it's the same with all kings and emperors. Don't, don't let them talk you into anything. But apart from everything superfluous they've got, the grown-ups have something that most certainly cannot be indifferent to us. I mean, God. I've not seen him with any one of them yet. But that's just what looks suspicious. It has occurred to me that in their distraction and fuss, and haste, they may have lost him somewhere, but he is something absolutely necessary. All sorts of things can't happen without him. The sun can't rise, babies can't come, and even bread would stop. Even if it does come out of the bakers, God sits and turns the big mills. It is easy to find lots of reasons why God is something we cannot do without. But this much is certain. The grown-ups aren't bothering about him, so we children must do it. Listen to a plan I've thought out. There are just seven of us children. Each of us may care, must carry God about with him for one day. Then he will be with us the whole week and we shall always know where he is at the moment. Here arose a great embarrassment. How was that to be done? Could, take, could one take God into one's hand or put him in one's pocket? Then a little boy said, Once I was all alone in the room, a little lamp burned beside me, and I sat up in bed and said my evening prayer very loud. 
Something moved inside my folded hands. It was soft and warm and like a little bird. I couldn't open my hands because the prayer wasn't open, wasn't over. But I wanted to very badly know and I prayed awfully fast. When I got to the amens, I went like this. The little boy stretched out his hand and spread out his fingers. But there was nothing there. This they could all picture to themselves. Even Hans had no suggestion. They were all looking at him. And then he suddenly said, How stupid! Anything can be God. One only has to tell it. <clears throat> He turned to the red-haired boy standing next to him. An animal can't do that, it would run away. But a thing you see stays where it is. Uh, you come into the room by day, by night, it is always there. It can very well be God. Gradually the others became convinced of this. Uh, but we need a small object, he continued, something one can carry with one everywhere, otherwise it's no good. Empty all your pockets. At that, some very strange things appeared. Scraps of paper, pen knives, erasers, feathers, bits of string, pebbles, screws, whistles, chips of wood, and much else not to be distinguished from this distance or for which I lack a name. Um, and all those things lay in the children's shallow hands as though frightened at the sudden possibility of turning into God. While any of them could shine a little, shone in order to please Hans. The choice hung in the balance a long time. At last there was found in little Reese's possession a thimble which she had taken from her mother one day. It was bright as though made of silver, and for its beauty's sake, it became God. Hans himself put it into his pocket, for he had the first turn, and the other children followed him about all day long and were proud of him. Only it was so hard to agree on who should have it the next day. So Hans, in his foresight, then and there, drew up a program for the whole week so that no quarrel should break out. This arrangement proved on the whole thoroughly expedient. One could see at first glance who had God, for that particular child walked rather more stiffly and solemnly and wore a Sunday face. For the first three days, the children spoke of nothing else. At every instant, one of them was asking to see God, and though the, tips, the thimble hadn't changed a whit under the influence of its great dignity, the thimble need, thimbleiness of it now seemed but a modest dress about its real form. Everything proceeded as arranged. On Wednesday, Paul had it. On Thursday, little Anna. Then came Saturday. The children were playing tag and romping in breathless confusion when Hans suddenly called out, Who has God now? They all stood still. Each looked at the other. Nobody remembered having seen him for the last two days. Hans, Hans counted off whose turn it was. The fact came out. It was little Marie's. And now they were asking little Marie, without more ado, to produce God. What was she to do? The little girl scratched around in her pockets. The only the only did, then only did she remember that, she, that he had been given to her in the morning, and now he was gone. She probably lost him here while playing. And when all the other children went home, little Marie stayed behind on the green, searching. The grass was fairly high. Twice people passed and asked whether she had lost anything. Each time the child answered, a thimble and went on looking. The people helped her for a time, but soon tired of stooping, and one man advised as he left, you had better go home now, you can always buy a new one. 
but still little Marie went on searching. The meadow became more and more mysterious in the dusk, and the grass began to get wet. Then another man came along. He bent over the child. What are you looking for? This time, little Marie, not far from tears, but brave and defiant, replied, I am looking for God. The stranger smiled and took her simply by the hand, and she let herself be led as though all was well now. On the way, the stranger said, And just look, what a beautiful thimble I found today. The evening clouds had long been impatient. Then the wise old man cloud, who had grown fat in the meantime, turned to me. Uh, pardon me, but may I ask what the country is called uh, over which you... But the other clouds ran laughing into the sky and dragged the old fellow along with them. This has to be my favorite story. <laughs> I, I hope you liked it too. Mm -hmm. We have time to read one more, but I'm, I'm certain that I want to reread this particular story uh, again. I have a sip. I'd like to read to you the next story that's called a tale of death and a strange postscript thereto. I was still gazing up into the slowly fading evening sky when someone said, you seem to be very much interested in that country up there. My glance fell quickly as if shot down and I realized I had come to the low wall of our little churchyard and before me, on the other side of it, stood the man with the spade, sagely smiling. I'm interested in this country here, he went on, pointing to the black, damp earth appearing here and there, between the many dead leaves that rustled as they stirred. While I, which, while I did not know, a wind had sprung up. Suddenly I exclaimed, seized with a violent aversion, why do you do that? The grave digger still smiled. It is a way of earning one's bread. And besides, I ask you, aren't most people doing the same? They bury God up there and I bury men here. He pointed to the sky and explained to me, yes, that too is a great grave. In summer, it is covered with wild forget-me-nots. I interrupted him. There was a time when the men buried God in the sky. That is true. And is it any different now? He asked, curiously sad. I went on. It used to be customary for everyone to throw a handful of sky over him. I know. But even then, he wasn't there anymore, or at least I hesitated. You know, I began again, in olden times, people prayed like this, and I spread my arms out wide, involuntarily feeling my breast expand at the gesture. In those days, God would cast himself into all these human abysses full of despair and darkness, and only reluctantly did he return to his heavens, which unnoticed he drew down ever closer over the earth. But a new faith began, and it could not make men understand, understand wherein its new God differed from their old one. For as soon as they began to praise him, men promptly recognized the one old God here too. Men promptly, the promulgator of the new commandment, changed the manner of praying. He taught the folding of hands and declared, See, thus does our God wish to be implored. 
so he must be another God from the one whom heretofore you have thought to receive into your arms. The people saw this, and the gesture of open arms became a despicable and dreadful one, and later it was fastened to the cross that all might see it as a symbol of agony and death. Now, when God looked next, looked down upon the earth, he was frightened. Besides the many folded hands, many Gothic cathedrals had been built. And so the hands and the roofs, all alike steep and sharp, stretched pointed, pointing toward him like the weapons of an enemy. With God, there is a different bravery. He turned back into his heavens, and when he saw that the steeples and the new prayers were growing in pursuit of him, he departed out of his domain at the other side and thus eluded the chase. He was himself astonished to find out, beyond his radiant home, a beginning darkness that received him silently. And with a curious feeling, he went on and on into this dusk that reminded him of the hearts of men. Then for the first time, it occurred to him that the heads of men are lucid, but their hearts full of a similar darkness. And a longing came over him to dwell in the hearts of men and no longer to move through the clear, cold wakefulness of their thinking well, God had continued on his way. Ever denser grows the darkness around him, and the night through which he presses, he presses on has something of the fragrant warmth, the fecund clods of earth. And in the little while, the roots will reach out toward him with the old, beautiful gesture of wide prayer. There's nothing wiser than the circle the God who had fled from us out of the heavens, out of the earth, will he come to us again? And who knows, perhaps you yourself will someday dig free the doer. But the man, the man with the spade said, but that is a fairy tale. In the words with which we speak, I answered gently, everything becomes a fairy tale for in them it can never have happened. The man stared for a while, reflecting. Then with, with impetuous gestures, he pulled on his coat, asking, we can go together, can't we? I nodded. I'm going home. I dare say we go the same way, but don't you live here? He stepped through the little latticed gate, swung it gently onto its plaintive hinges and answered, no. After a few steps, he grew more confidential. You are quite right just now, he said. It is strange that anyone can be found who wants to do that job back there. I never used to think about it. But now, since I'm growing older, thoughts come to me sometimes, singular thoughts, like that about the sky, and others too, death. What do we know of it? Apparently everything and perhaps nothing. Often children, I don't know to whom they belong to, stand round me as I work. And then I get one of these ideas. I dig like a wild beast so as to draw all my strength away from my brain and use it up in my arm. The grave gets much deeper than the regulations call for and a mountain of earth rises beside it. But the children run away when they see my wild movements. They think I am angry for some reason, he pondered. And, and, and it is a kind of anger. You grow callous, you, you think you've got the better of it, and then suddenly, it's no good. Death is something incomprehensible, a terrible. We were following a long road under fruit trees, already quite leafless. And on our left, the forest began, like a night that might at any moment engulf us. 
I would like to relate to you a little story I said tentatively. It's just long enough to last us till we get there. The man nodded and lighted his old stub of a pipe. I began. There were two people, a man and a woman, and they loved each other. To love is to accept nothing from anywhere, to forget everything, and to want to receive everything from one person, both that which one already had and all else. That was the mutual wish of these two. But in the realm of time, by day, among the many, where so much comes and goes, often before one has gotten into real touch with it, it is not pos at all possible to carry through such loving. Events rush in from all sides, and chance opens every door to them. For this reason, the two decided to leave the daily world and go into solitude, far away from the striking of clocks and the noises of the city. And there, in a garden, they built themselves a house. And the house had two doors, one on its right side and one on its left. And the right-hand door was the man's door, and everything that was his was to pass through it into the house. The door on the left was the woman's door, and all that she cared about was to enter in that way. And so it was. The one who woke first in the morning went down and opened his door. And so, until late as night, late at night, a very great deal indeed came in even though the house was not on the edge of the road. To those who know how to receive, the landscape comes into the house, and the light and a breeze with a fragrance about its shoulders, and much more besides. But past things also, figures, destinies, came in by both these doors, and all were welcomed with the like simple hospitality so that they felt as though they had always been at home in the house on the heath. This went on for a long time, and the two were very happy because of it. The door at the left was opened rather more often, but by the right-handed door entered more motley guests. And before the first door one morning waited, death. The man slammed his door quickly shut when he noticed him and kept it tightly bolted all day long. After some time, death appeared at the door on the left. Trembling, the woman flung it to and shot the broad bolt home. They did not speak to each other of this occurrence, but they opened both doors less often and tried to get along with what they had in the house. Of course, they had to live much more meagerly than before. Their provisions grew scarce and cares set in. They both began to sleep badly. And in one of these, those long wakeful nights, they both at once suddenly heard a strange scuffling and knocking noise. It came from outside the house wall equally far from the two doors, and sounded as though someone were beginning to break out the stones in order to make a new door midway in the wall. Even in their terror, the two pretended they did not notice anything unusual. They began to talk, to laugh unnaturally loud, and when they were tired out, the rummaging in the wall had stopped. Since then, both the doors had remained closed. The two live like prisoners. Their health is failing, and they have strange fancies. The noise is repeated from time to time. Then they laugh with their lips, while their hearts almost die of fear. And they both know that the burrowing is always getting louder and clearer and they must talk and laugh louder and louder with their always wearied voices. I ceased. Yes, yes, 
said my companion. So it is. That is a true story. I read this one in an old book, I went on to add, and a very curious thing happened when I was doing so. At the end of the line, which tells how death came also to the woman's door, there had been drawn in old and faded ink a little star. It peeped out from between the words as between clouds, and for a moment I fancied that were the lines to draw apart, they might reveal a lot of stars standing there behind them, as does something happen when the spring sky clears late of an evening. Then I forgot all about the insignificant circumstance until one day, on the smooth, glossy paper inside the back cover of the book, I found, as though mirrored in a lake, the same little star. And close beneath it, delicate lines began, with, which flowed away like waves over the pale, reflecting surface. The writing had become blurred in many places, but still I was able to decipher nearly all of it. It said something of this sort. I have read this story so often on all possible kinds of days that I sometimes believe I have written it down myself out of my own memory. But for me, it goes on as I set it down here. The woman had never seen death. In all innocence, she let him enter. But death said rather hurriedly, and as one whose conscience is not clear, give this to your husband. And he added quickly as she looked inquiringly at him, it is seed, very good seed. Then he went away without looking back. The woman looked, opened the little sack he had pressed into her hand. There really were seeds of some kind in it, hard, ugly grains. And the woman thought, a seed is something incomplete, belonging to the future. One cannot tell what will come of it. I, I won't give my husband these unsightly grains. They don't look in the least like a gift. Rather, I will tuck them into the flower bed in our garden and wait to see what grows out of them. Then I will lead him to the plant and tell the him how I came by it. And so the woman did. And they continued to live as before. The man who could not forget that death had stood before his portal was at first somewhat uneasy, but when he saw the woman as hospitable and carefree as ever, he too soon opened the wide wings of his door again, so, so that much life and light came into the house. The following spring there stood in the middle of the bed, among the slender tiger lilies, a small shrub. It had narrow blackish leaves, rather pointed like those of the laurel, and a peculiar gleam lay on their dark surface. Every day the man intended to ask whence the plant had sprung, but every day he failed to do so. In a similar reticence, the woman from day to day withheld her explanation. But the suppressed question on the one side and the never ventured answer on the other drew the two together often before the little shrub, the green darkness of which contrasted so strangely with the garden. When the next spring came, they busied themselves with the shrub as much as with the other plants, and they were saddened when Surrounded by so much growing bloom, it came up unchanged and mute as in the first year, insensible to all sun. Then it was that they determined, without telling each other, to devote all their energy in the third spring to this plant. And as that spring appeared, they tenderly fulfilled and hand in hand what each had promised to himself. The garden all around grew wild, and the tiger lilies seemed paler than usual. 
but once after a night heavy and overcast, they stepped out into the garden, the quiet, shimmering morning garden. They saw from the sharp, sharp black leaves of the strange shrub, a pale blue flower had sprung unscathed, bursting now the too close sheath about its bud. And they stood before it, united and silent, and now they knew less than ever what to say. For they were thinking, now death is flowering. And together they bent down to savor the fragrance of the young bloom. And since that morning, everything has been different in the world. This is what it said, I concluded, inside the cover of the old book. And who would have written it? urged the grave digger. A woman by its handwriting, I replied, but what good would it have done to find out? The characters were very faded and rather old-fashioned. Probably she had long been dead. My companion was lost in thought. Only a story, he admitted at last, and yet it touches one's soul. Ah, that if that that is, if one doesn't hear stories often, I said soothingly. You think so? He gave me his hand and I held it fast. But I would like so much to repeat it. May I? I nodded. Then he suddenly remembered. But I have no one. Whom shall I tell it to? Oh, that's easy. Tell it to the children who sometimes come to watch you. Whom else? And the children have really heard the last three stories. That is, the one repeated by the evening clouds, only in part, if I am correctly informed. The children are small, of course, and so they are much further from the evening clouds than we. But in the case of that story, this is just as well. For in spite of Hans's long, well-worded speech, they would realize that the affair took place among children, and as experts would look upon my telling of it critically. But it is better that they should not learn with what efforts and how awkwardly we experience the things that happen quite simply and so naturally to them. I enjoyed reading these to you We'll see you tomorrow night for more stories of God. Good night. Many blessings. Please take time to meditate. If you don't know how to meditate, just remain quiet, not thoughtless, but just quiet and easy, doing absolutely nothing. Enjoy. See you tomorrow. Good night.